tropicals, I mean, we aren't in the tropics here in North Carolina, but there's so much that we can actually grow that would be considered tropical or subtropical. Uh, and you probably already are growing a lot of things in your garden that are tropical already in reality or from the subtropics. And that includes a bunch of your summer annuals. Uh, for instance, I have just a couple here that you can see maybe down here. I have a, a catharanthus or vinca or periwinkle, Madagascar periwinkle. So where do you think that one regionally comes from? from, from the tropics of Africa, uh, begonias, semperflorens, cultorums, and their hybrids. This is probably a South American tropical, or hybrid, uh, or of origins anyways. But begonias are from the subtropics and tropics throughout the whole entire uh, world. So um, those are two uh, groups that you're probably already growing. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about some other things here and some things that you might use in your landscape. Uh, in conjunction, say, with those plants that you, um, Doug talked about actually last week on his Four Seasons talk, these aren't the Four Season plants mostly. There'll be a handful that could be a Four Season, but most of these are going to be much more seasonal and they can be used to fill those gaps uh, of time that, uh, say, when you first plant a landscape, you want to uh, need something to fill it up quickly. A lot of these tropicals will work. They, they tend to be bold and um, they fill in quickly, like I said. So um, as I'll talk about a few things here later on um, for that purpose, and you already know that with many of our summer annuals, like the vinca and the begonias. So we're gonna get started here. And this bed, I had the interns plant just about two months ago this week, I believe. Uh, uh, so it, it, you can see what's going on here. Most of these plants were quite small at that point, including the elephant ears. I think Alexander is uh, panning so you can see a little bit. There are some holes. Um, we have these things called rabbits in the garden. So this uh, will give us an indication of what is rabbit proof too. So uh, we always get those critter issues. So uh, we'll go through some of these plants here and see what we can uh, suggest and uh, just give you some ideas. Um, I did not, this is totally what I would call a tropical garden. I have not included too many other uh, woodies or other temperate plants in here, but you could incorporate these in uh, with your temperate plants as well. So I'm going to come over this direction because I have a really nice clump of here. Um, I'm hoping people know this plant, one of these plants that's right in front of me. I have caladiums. Caladiums are um, kind of like a small elephant ear. They're tropical America uh, uh, in origin. So they go with a wet season, dry season. Really easy to use on our landscapes here. They'll take full sun or shade. Uh, they just like our hot weather to really get them going. These were planted as tubers uh, in late May. Um, so you can see how much they have grown here. Um, uh, the family that they're in is a, an important one for us for our summer tropicals. And some of them are actually hardy. The caladiums are not reliable here. Even in our mildest winters right now, you only get a fraction of them that will survive. But um, they're in the Araceae family, so the Arum family, which there are lots of those that you're probably growing yourself. You might have some in your house. Uh, if you have uh, Peace Lily, which is Fathophyllum, or a Devil's Ivy, the uh, Epipremnum, uh, Philodendron, those are all related to the, uh, the Caladium here, as are our elephant ears, which behind this, I don't know if Alexander can get to this, I have uh, Colocasia gigantea Thailand giant form. Um, that was actually grown from seed that I sowed in December. Um, and they were about six inches tall when they were planted in here in May. And you can see how much they have grown. They have exponential growth, uh, wonderful filler plants as a result, and bold. I love the boldness of the foliage on them. And these are two things, and any of their relatives in their racy tend to be rabbit resistant as well as deer resistant. They don't touch them. They have chemicals in them that are really nasty and hard for us to digest, as well as those rabbits, and they will make your mouth swell a little bit if you do ingest them. So uh, it, it's as uh, much of an issue for them as for us, so they avoid them. So safe ones to plant. So, uh, which, you know, here's one of the other elephant ears here. This is an alocasia. This is alocasia portadora. Later in the summer, this will probably be five to six feet tall. They can get seven or eight when they're really happy and settled in. That one is another one that's hardy for us here, typically most winters. Pardon? We're back feeding? 
we have someone that has their microphone on, please turn it off. I have lost control of my controls over here and I don't want to lose things. Please mute your microphones, everyone. There you go, you're good, Tim. Uh, okay, we ready? Yep. Okay, yeah, so various elephant ears. Those are all aeroids and eraceae. Great ones to plant in your landscape. Fast growing, rabbit and deer resistant. Um, and some of them are actually hardy here. The caladiums, like I said, are not. Uh, the Colocasia gigantea, some winters will survive, some winters not. It is such a fast growing plant that I would just recommend buying one at your local nursery in the spring, planting it out when our weather gets warm and it will grow enormous. That will be six or eight feet tall by the end of summer and have leaves that are literally the size of Chris's table, which you can't see, but um, bigger than his box. <laughs> Other things that are great for uh, for um, for adding some texture into the landscape, especially with in contrast to the elephant ears, are some of the grasses, which I'm sure you're already using some of the uh, hardier grasses, the hardy ornamental grasses like panicums and miscanthus and cordideria and who knows, there's so many of those. Uh, but there's tropical ones as well that can give us a totally different look than some of those. One of them that uh, that I'm really happy with and I really enjoy this plant. It's a lot smaller growing than many of the ornamental grasses. This is actually a corn. Um, this is not the corn we eat. This is, uh, which is Zia maize. That's the genus and species for our, our, our edible corn. This is Zia perennis, a totally different species. It only gets like three to four feet tall when it's uh, in flower, but most of the time it's about two, uh, to, uh, two feet or so tall uh, on this, this cultivar, which I actually have to look. Um, it's winning streak, I believe. I have, to, I have a, uh, a, a hidden piece of paper for some of the names that I don't remember, remember. Yes, winning streak is this corn right here. We've been propagating this and using it in the garden the last few years. It is a patented cultivar and I really like it. It's not readily available. I don't know why. It's been great. I am finding though, I see some nipping on it. It's not rabbit resistant and I'm doubting it's deer resistant, but it might be. But regardless, really bold foliage. You can see the white stripes on this. Um, it, the flowers are insignificant. I have one in the nursery I was just looking at the, uh, a little while ago. It is about this tall in flower, though here's actually one pushing up here uh, that's a lot smaller, but um, nothing spectacular to write about on the flowers. It just looks like the tassels on your corn, but I don't know, a sad looking one. The whole reason to grow this plant is it's fo bold foliage. Another grass uh, over here in this part of the bed is one of our Penicetum purpureums. And I forgot to look up which cultivar this is. And I don't know if I have it labeled right now, but this is one of the Penicetum purpureums. Um, there's a bunch of these available. Um, over the years, we've grown one called Prince. There's a couple different princesses. One I really like, I don't have in here this year right now is black stockings. Um, some of them have been reliably hardy. Others like black stockings, I cannot keep through the winter reliably outside, but super fast growing. Um, this was about this tall when, uh, you know, 10 to 12 inches tall when we planted it in May, uh, late May. And it is now up to about five feet here. Um, uh, this one, this selection here, if this were black stockings, uh, it gets up to eight to 10 feet tall, but this, it would only be half as wide as this one. Um, these dark foliage grasses are really cool. Uh, they, they fill in so quickly and add some wonderful texture. And that's some of the things I like about a lot of the tropicals, the boldness of their foliage. I don't necessarily worry about the colorful flowers on a lot of them, though I do grow some things for the blossoms as well. So uh, those are just a couple grasses. There's just so many things that we can grow. In front of me now is one you probably have grown for decades, again, yourself. Um, dahlias, your grandmother probably grew them, if nothing else. I grew these back home in Pennsylvania. They are from subtropical uh, high elevations of Mexico and uh, down to Panama. Um, there are a lot of new selections out there that have wonderful foliage uh, to add to decent flowers. Um, I don't 
Uh, I might have a label here still. Yes, this is, for instance, this is HS Flame, which uh, is Happy Single Flame is the, the trade name for that one. Wonderful foliage, even when it's not in blossom. Um, I don't go necessarily for the big dinner plate dahlias. I go for the ones that have nice foliage and the smaller flowers. Uh, they're self-cleaning if they're single flowers like this or semi-double. The full doubles tend to get a snot rag in there that turns brown and holds on the plant until you actually come along and pick it off. Um, but these are actually subtropicals. Here in the Raleigh area, we can leave these in the ground for the most part. But if you get in the mountains of North Carolina or further north in the uh, northeastern United States and throughout the, well, more or less the northern half of the United States, you do need to dig them to bring them through the winter for the most part. For us, uh, we have the advantage that you can plant them and forget them if you want, or you can dig them. Um, they're very, uh, quite easy going. I do find though, unlike a lot of our tropicals, if we have a lot of hot weather in the summer, they will go summer dormant. Uh, and then they'll often perk back up in say late August and September to give us a fall display as well. They can look a little sad pretty often in July. We're lucking out this year. July has been relatively mild. So um, they're actually doing a, a little bit in here. So Chris is warning me about something. No, we just have a couple of questions sure. before we lose them on the chat. I just like to address them. And everyone, once again, please go ahead and mute your microphones. I don't want to touch my Zoom because I'll probably kill it. So go ahead and please mute yourself so you can uh, help everyone out. Um, the questions are, is uh, someone wants you to address the shade versus sun and the caladiums. They're, of course, okay. used to caladiums being out in a whole lot of shade and mm -hmm. are wondering why you have them in full sun. Because I can. Plant your caladiums as a tuber. Uh, directly in the ground where you want them to grow, they will adapt to that. Occasionally, you can get some burnt leaves. This one is super pink and lacks any green except for right on the edge. So um, this one has a little bit of burn, but it's minimal. So I can put up with that. Still beautiful, bold foliage. Um, does that answer the person's question yep. about that? Yeah, and the other question was, is the um uh, plant name for the corn okay. included perennis, and they're wanting, does that mean it's perennial in this area? Not in our area. It's still winter it inside. It's still tender for us. It, where it's native to probably in Central America, it's, it's perennial. Uh, it has not survived in our climate the last couple. I've had it in the ground the last two or three years, and we have not had any survive, even though we've had zone nine winters. So it's not going to be one that survives in our climate for a while, unless we get additional global warming. So are we good then? Okay, so we're going to continue down through here. I'm going to come to an old standby here in the south. Everyone should know this plant. This is a canna. Cannas are really um, tropical and here in North Carolina we do take them a little bit for granted. Growing up in western Pennsylvania where I was from, they were exotic tropicals. Um, I will say the advantage of further north, you don't get canna leaf roller. Um, here, if uh, after a few years, they tend to get so infested with it that my foliage ones like this one here, which is Bengal Tiger or Pretoria, whatever you want to call it, um, this one will uh, get canna leaf roller and they're not as pretty then and it can be good to dig them all out and start over. They are hardy here uh, and um, great pass along plants, but again, um, and they are bold. And the deer typically don't touch them either. I find these plants that have real big bold foliage tend to be deer safe. Um, so anyways, we won't stay too long on cannas. So I've plant, uh, brought a collection here. Um, everyone now is probably seeing these plants, the mangaves. And I also have one agave over here. So most of them are not totally hardy for us here in the uh, Raleigh area even. There's a handful that are proving hardy, but most of them are not. So I just have a selection of them here. Um, we have Mission to Mars. So this is the Elon Musk one. You know, oh. <laughs> really would love this one. Um, and let's see. I don't remember who this one is offhand. Oh, let's see. There's some various sides. Uh, this is Thunderbird and then Carnival. They make excellent container plants for us here. You can plant these in containers. If they'll deal with our summer water, uh, rain, if nothing else, unless you have them in the worst spot. As long as they're getting some natural water, they won't have to be irrigated. So it, it's a really wonderful thing. You can go away on vacation and you not have to worry about these one ounce. And 
most of the time critters don't bother them either. So um, you get different sizes, different um, colors and textures. This one has made me bleed a couple times since I put it here this afternoon for this display. Um, wow, um, Carnival is a really friendly one. It's very soft. It does have some teeth, but not bad at all. Um, but agaves are also great for a tropical look. They're a desert tropical. This one is actually probably a hardy hybrid. It's supposedly an ovatifolia crossed with a flexispina, which are both hardy for us here. Um, but um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. We can grow those here in this uh, region of the country. And they're for that desert tropical look, though many of them are perfectly happy in our climate and grow super fast with our wet um, or our moist summers uh, as long as they're planted in a well-drained spot for the winter. Uh, and many of them will also do well in containers even if they aren't hardy and you can bring them in and out as long as they're not too big. And that's another thing, those plants that you've had, those house plants that you've had for years that you don't know what to do with it because it's, it's outgrown your house. Um, you can give them their last hurrah or say you're moving or that is your neighbor was moving and they didn't want to throw out all their plants and they gifted you something and you took it just to be nice. Um, you can stick it in your garden for at least one last season of interest. So um, these when these get too big, just leave them out there and start over. They grow super fast. Um, then you don't have to move them back in and out uh, when they get too mean. So uh, that's a great one for that. It sounds it looks like Chris is saying we have another question. I'm hoping. I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, we do have another question. Going back to the cannas. You okay. Mentioned one thing for the leaf roller. Um, is there any way to treat an existing problem other than scrapping your whole entire collection? Sorry there are chemicals, and I don't even. I have not used them in the garden, but I don't know what they are offhand. You um, you might check with extension. I'm not going to mess with chemical talking. Um, it is a caterpillar of a species of a skipper butterfly. Um, and I don't want to mess with that. They do disfigure them pretty, uh, they can make them really ugly. So B BT may not be all that effective yeah. since they're sealed up in the plant. That's the thing. They are sealed in there. Uh, and I'd hate to use the systemic because uh, of the possibility of when they're flowering, the, uh, some of the systemics will go through the, uh, still tra transmitted through the pollen and can poison our bees. So yeah, My, my um, Bengal tiger at home had uh, leaf rollers yeah. and I just opened the leaves up and picked them out and flicked them. Yes, they, uh, the caterpillar is nearly clear. It's gross. It's gross, yes. But they, they seal the leaves closed and don't let them ro un um, roll. So you don't get as nice a display. These were some we had in the nursery. I'm having a little bit of damage here, but it's, it's bearable at this point. I have some other patches that aren't quite so good. So are we good now? Okay, so we're gonna continue on down through here. Let's see, who do I have? Oh, not a grass, but a grass-like plant, which I had thought would be beautiful and has been other years in our garden, is Cyparis papyrus. Love it. So that's uh, papyrus in, in the garden, but rabbits apparently love it as well. I have found this year, uh, they are eaten to nothing. So normally I'd say Cyparis papyrus is a wonderful plant, four to six feet tall. It will grow in your average garden soil, uh, but it prefers to be a little bit moist and is, will grow even bigger if it's moist. It can grow in a water garden. Maybe that's the place to put it. In Chris's water garden next week, you can put the Cyparis papyrus. And I don't think the rabbits like to swim. So. Uh, anyways, my poor Cyparis, I expected this to be this big by now. They've been eating them in the trials as well, which is where I got the extras of those. Um, in the front, if you like vines, and I'll talk about, hope might get a chance to talk about another vine uh, later on, but I have, uh, I stole one from our trials. In the hanging baskets, we have some Mandevilla. And actually, for containers, they are excellent because they want a restricted root, um, root run. They don't, in the open garden, they don't always flower real well. So you can put these in a container. They're also, they have fleshy roots once they're established. And they're, they'll take drying out uh, while you're away. You could almost grow them with your agaves and mangaves. But um, this is one of the Manda, new hybrid mandevillas um, from the trials. I don't know which one it is offhand. Let's see. This is Sun Paracel. Um, garden. So this is a, a white one with a yellow throat. We also have a milky yellow one uh, now as well. But 
often deep pinks, but they can give you some height. You can grow them up through things. Um, but I would grow them with a restricted root, um, root zone, so to force them into flowering better. Uh, I had one for, oh, probably 10 years back home in Pennsylvania um, that I kept in a pot. Um, and it was just a small clay pot and it was, it was Alice DuPont and she would get three or four feet tall. If I had put her in a bigger pot, she would have gotten way bigger. So we're going to continue down here. Um, for those who have shade in their garden, um, I have a collection of begonias. That is not our wax type begonias or our Semperflorin cultorum hybrids, but these are some of the rhizominous ones. Like um, we have one of the um, Rex types begonias here, which I don't have the name, but it's over here in our trials. Uh, this is um, beautiful foliage and it's doing well in our summer heat. Not all the uh, Rex begonias like us, so uh, we're finding some of them will, will grow here. Uh, I'm gonna step forward here and. Uh, get some of my other ones here. So a couple weeks ago when the interns were talking, um, Julio actually showed us a, cu a kissing cousin to this one. This is uh, Begonia agalia, which um, the main difference from what I was reading about these is, uh, and another species that Julio talked about, which was Pedata fida, is the um, depth of the leaf sinuses here. Uh, Pedata fida has really long fingers. Uh, uh, agalia has very sh uh, short or shallow leaf sinuses, kind of more like a maple leaf, but not like a Japanese maple. Um, but I'm anxious to try this one. Uh, Pedata fida has um, been really good for us. This is wild collected seedlings uh, that Mark collected in 2019 in China. So uh, we haven't planted any of these in the garden yet, but I think tomorrow I have a crew of people who might, uh, we might throw this in for them to plant in our Asian Valley or in our um, uh, Lath House. But um, anyways, uh, this is one I expect to do very well for us. So if you like Anita Shady Tropical, another begonia, which we've been had in, in the Lath House for a couple years now is Begonia Chandler's Hardy. This was one, um, oh, I, Chandler, I can't, uh, it was a guy from, um, Washington or Oregon, I can't remember which. He found this one in China, and this is one that's been popularized. The trade name for it, they've actually given it a trade name, is Shangri-La. Um, but beautiful speckled foliage, um, and it's been doing well in our laugh house. Uh, not all of the begonias are hardy, and uh, there are some. This is a really cool one. I don't know if this shows up. Can you see the hairs on this one? This is begonia size morier. Um, it is, it's, it's like an eyelashes all over the leaves. Um, really cool pattern. It's really closely related to um, the Rex begonias again. Um, it, it's a little finicky for us in the greenhouse and I've not um, overwintered this one outside, but it is, it's, it's just cool. Uh, it's worth a try. Um, another one that actually, I think Mark brought this one back from uh, Cuba. Uh, on the uh, trip a few years ago, but this is um, Vigonia uh, nalumbolifolia, uh, nalumbo as in um, the nalumbo, the lotuses. So this has a leaf like a lotus. I'm told this species can get great big. The leaves can get enormous. Um, and if it's the uh, leaf petiole attaches right in the middle of the leaf like that on a nalumbo, so or a, a lotus leaf. So that's where that one comes from. Uh, we haven't tried this, or actually I have tried this in the lath house. It's, it hasn't been hardy, but um, do like this one um, that you could put out for the summer. For part shade to sun, I'll go back here a little bit, are a lot of gingers. Um, this is one, uh, I have to look here, this is vanilla ice. This is a variegated one. Um, which is a mutation of Dr. Moy, which was an older variegated one. It has a little less variegation, but still the same color of flower. Um, and this smells heavenly. Again, deer do not touch gingers. Rabbits haven't either so far, um, but I won't put it past them. Um, so it's a great thing there. And un like their leaves are similar to cannas, but they don't get canna leaf roller either. So another benefit, uh, they often have wonderfully fragrant flowers, uh, typically in shades of white and yellow and uh, orange. There are some nearly red ones too, but they tend not, the orange and red ones are less likely to have nice fragrance, but um, they can also give you some height 
uh, and like I said, they'll take full sun to part shade. So it can uh, fill that gap, the part shade part, and uh, give you a little bit of a textural difference. But the Hadikiums are typically hardy for us. Chris, have a question? Yes, we have a couple of questions there in the chat, but uh, we know we have a few new people. And for those of you that, that have been here for a while, just a reminder, I don't have a really good response rate from my chat, so I can't answer questions that we're getting live. So there's gonna be a big delay in them. Uh, but Tim, someone asked for a repeat of the name of the first begonia that you did. Okay, the first begonia. I don't have the name for this one. Actually, could one of you guys run right over there for me? and get the label off that. Okay, and while you're waiting for the name, Paul uh, saw the banana whiz by and you skipped oh, it. Oh yeah, I forgot my banana. I'll talk about that. Okay, you can talk about the banana a little bit. Thanks, I forgot Tim. about it though, because I was standing right in front of it. So here, I'm gonna get this from one of my interns and helpers. So this begonia down here, I'm hoping that they're talking about. Okay, begonia, uh, so it's T-Rex first blush. And that's not its real name, but that's its trade name that you'll find it as. So I'll hold this right here. It has a Terra Nova number, I'm sure. It is from Terra Nova Nurseries in Oregon. Um, and I think they're rated zone nine. So if we have winters like the last two or three, might be hardy. I planted a few of these in our lap house to see if any of those survive. So um, another one, Begonia, going back to them, that's been really uh, good the last few winters when we have mild winters is Little Brother, um, or Brother Montgomery. Brother Montgomery, so. Does the ginger overwinter? This one does. The uh, Hadikiums, most Hadikiums have been really good for us here. And some Hadikiums will go into zone six even. Um, but zone seven is safe for most. There are some that are less hardy that we can't grow here. Uh, some of the epiphytic ones and uh, more tropical ones, but there's literally dozens that we can grow in the gingers. Uh, that is the Hadikiums. Uh, another ginger, which, am I safe to talk about it now or is there still more questions? Okay, this is one that's probably not hardy here. This is a globa or globa. Uh, this is winty eye. Um, much like the hadiki, I mean the um, uh, caladiums earlier, this one you can dry out and store for the winter. This is a, a much smaller growing one, great for in a container. Or you can plant it out for the summer. This is one uh, Doug has been keeping in the nursery. We haven't planted any in the garden yet, but we're starting to get, a, uh, I think we could divide this into a few pieces that we, maybe next year we can plant it out. But this is sometimes called Dancing Ladies. Um, spectacular pink bracts on this one uh, with little yellow flowers. Um, that I think that might where the dancing lady comes from. We do have another species on our lath house, which um, is borderline hardy here. It survives, if nothing else, by little tuberals that it forms on the, the flower stalks when it's done flowering. But this one does not form tuberals. But um, globus could be a really good one. This will take a decent amount of shade. So this can be a nice container plant to sit in the shade um, and, and brighten your, uh, your garden up. Or you can plant it out for the summer. There's other species of globas as well. Another question, Chris? Yeah, we do have another question. Uh, Rachel is wondering, is it is now a good time to transplant the gingers? And of course, you can not, do hadikium do almost any time. Um, and you could probably divide this now if you really wanted to, um, but it's really pretty. Um, it, it, they're warm, uh, they're active when it's warm. So it looks we like have they have someone another. that has their microphone unmuted. Please mute your microphones for me. I cannot do it here on my end without crashing Zoom. Please mute your microphones. Okay, we good now? Okay, is that enough about gingers? There are other gingers you can grow too. I didn't have any over here, uh, but some of the curcumas, uh, which would be like two, uh, um, turmeric is one of the, uh, the curcumas. Um, we grow two or three different species in the garden. Uh, they don't even think about coming up until it gets real warm in um, the end of May at the earliest and typically first of June. But they're also really cool gingers to grow. And again, deer and rabbits, don't touch them. Um, they, they, have, they don't like that spice in their life like we like ginger in our, ours. Uh, there's some other more temperate growing gingers, Mioga, which we grow in Asian Valley. It's actually hardy to zone six. Um, uh, but these are some of the subtropical ones. Now I'm gonna, I have in this bed, I actually have a couple palms, but it's hard to see them in here. So I'll talk a little bit about some palms. There's are a fair number of palms that we can grow here in North Carolina, especially in the Raleigh area. Um, the ones that do best for us that form trunks are typically the tracheocarpus. This one, 
It's a complex hybrid. So oh, this is, uh, we don't, I don't know if we have this one in the garden yet, actually, but this is just a baby. This is um, a trachycarpus or a windmill palm, Chinese windmill palm type. Um, this is a hybrid between trachycarpus princeps, which princeps is known for silver on the undersides of its leaves. Um, and another called uh, Fortunii, and I think, is it cultivar? Wagnerianus is what we're saying now, uh, which is one of the uh, slightly smaller growing Trachycarpus Fortunii. It does really well in our area here. So I'm curious to see how this does, but a lot of the trachies have been great for us. Um, well, uh, if, uh, another one is our native um, Sable Minor, which is much slow, uh, much lower growing. Uh, they range, depending on the ecotype uh, that you get, anywhere from three to eight feet, but they do not form trunks. Um, some of the other uh, trunk forming species or hybrids, uh, there's one called, um, uh, let's see, Brazoriensis, which is an old hybrid that occurred in the wild they, uh, several thousand years ago uh, in Texas. And I can't remember if it's be they believe it was between uh, Sable Minor and Sable Mexicana or Sable Minor and Sable um, Palmetto, which historically occurred in this one area, which only Sable Minor occurs with now. There are these trunking Sable Miners. That one does very well for us. An old hybrid uh, that's been available called Birmingham is another really good one. Um, those are not native here, but um, one of our other native species here to North Carolina is not ideal here. It will grow here. We can get damage. Uh, would be sable palmetto, the, um, the state tree of South Carolina. Um, it's one of the two species, sable minor and sable palmetto, are native to North Carolina. There are two native uh, species, but sable palmetto in a hard winter can get killed here. Out at the coast, you will see them everywhere. Um, but we are just on the borderline right here. And uh, in 2018, we lost at least two or three in our, our Zeric garden that were of decent size. But we've had one in the garden for 25 years though too, and it's been unfazed. So um, it sometimes depends on the provenance of where they came from. Um, another palm, which ew, you can't see back in here real well. I'm gonna pull this out of the way for the moment. It, um, there's a sable, I mean, a Washingtonia in here. These are borderline for us. These are uh, one of uh, the one species of palm native to California, which I always find ironic, but um, uh, a Washingtonia, they don't always survive our winters. They're very fast growing. Um, they might survive for two or three years and then get zapped or they might get killed the first year. Uh, where they are happy, they can form rather large um, trees. I mean, 20, 30 feet tall. Um, they like a drier climate. Uh, there's a selection, a seed strain from Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. It's been growing there for decades and decades. Those aren't even reliable here, so. Uh, but can be used in your landscape if you want to give them a try. Um, I've seen pictures for, uh, for Trachycarpus, for instance, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, that uh, there's a, a guy who has them, uh, he builds, uh, actually, and in Ontario, Canada, and various places, they will build boxes over their palms to keep them through the winter. I don't go to that extremes here. So if the Washingtonia survives, it survives. So uh, let's see, time-wise, we're doing well. So something that might be mistaken as a palm, and I'm being mean to this right here, and this is actually a somewhat rare one, but this is one of the cycas. This is, I don't know if I can spit this one out. I'll see if I can do it. This is Cycus changianus, uh, changiensis. So uh, we've had this one in our nursery. I have not planted it yet. Um, Cycus in the past have had an issue with walking away from the garden on weekends. So um, this is a rare one. It's not Cycus revoluta. Yep. So once again, please mute your microphones. I don't have control over the microphones today because of uh, computer access. Please mute your microphone because we are hearing you on every computer connected to today's meeting. Thank you. Okay, we good again? So cycus, uh, uh, this one I expect probably hardy. We're finding a lot more of the cycus are hardy and there's some really cool hybrids that have turned out hardier even than say um, the sago palm, uh, cycus revoluta. 
Um, out of the coast, you will see Cycas revoluta everywhere. Here in Raleigh, they're uncommon, though they will grow here. If we have a hard winter, they will totally defoliate, but they will recover uh, quickly. Uh, so that's why I just have this one here. We'll, we'll, I'll have to sometime actually plant this one. It is actually looking pretty cool. But it's it's filled its pot, and I need to repot it even if not. And <clears throat> it doesn't want to stand up on its own right now. So uh, while I'm down here, um, I said about those tropicals that you don't know what to do with, you might do it. This is actually a very rare, actually, Fatsia. It's a third species of Fatsia, not Fatsia japonica or Polycarpa. This is Polycarpa here. Um, and what is this one? Oligocarpella, which is a more subtropical to tropical species of Fatsia, which we don't know if this one will make it here yet. So we're going to take some cuttings of this one and see if it'll grow. But lots of you probably grow Fatsia, especially out of the coast. Uh, but here in Raleigh, we can grow them. They aren't as fast growing, but um, Fatsia japonica being the most common. Um, great foundation plants here. I've heard of these growing in up into the, uh, that is Fatsia japonica is being grown up into southern New England when they protect them um, or have a very mild winter, whichever. Because um, even here they can get damaged. But um, this is our Fatsia polycarpa that we have in the uh, lat or yeah in the lath house, which got a name and I don't have it listed on this label because this is an old label. But this is one of our babies, bit different leaf structure than typical Fatsia uh, japonica that we grow, so um, it's a little bit distinct. But this is less hardy than Fatsia. Uh, japonica and uh, if we have a normal winter not the not zone nine winters we've had the last two or three years um, we do tend to get damage on it in the winter but uh, really cool subtropical plant to grow for, uh, here uh, this one is from uh, Taiwan I believe this is maybe J I don't know if this one's Japanese Taiwanese or Chinese I can't remember this is a little bit different distribution and far less common uh, but anyways uh, you can get variegated forms of fatsias which are great to use in your landscape again those big bold foliage leaves uh, really cool and they give you uh, fatsia japonica gives you it's one of those four season plants so unlike a lot of the other stuff I've shown you uh, that's one of the four season plants uh, in here so, for those who have house plants, oh, Chris has either a question or a, a well, we issue. We have a few questions. are getting ready to go off the screen. So I hope we can uh, go ahead and do sure. them real fast before I lose them. Uh, Dick was wondering, uh, was that um, uh, begonia little brother Montgomery? Is that one? Uh, that one has been here? borderline. I mean, we've had it the last couple winters. If we have a normal winter, I think it might get zapped out freeze out totally, but the last uh, two or three winters we've had no problem with it. It dies to the ground and comes back up. Okay. But okay. beautiful foliage on that, and it'll flower in late summer and fall. We just had a little private comment that uh, down in Brunswick County, they lost almost 300 of the sable palmettos. Yes. Uh, in 2017, 2018. Yeah, we had, when we now. got to, uh, we had our most hours below freezing consecutive yep. on record it was a really major number higher than normal. So and yet that's, didn't die. that's when we lost our uh, several of ours in the garden as well. Yeah. So, and, and a couple of one, you haven't talked about a ficus, right, Tim? I, I have not talked okay. about so figgies. I was asking about the name of the ficus. We have not talked about a ficus. No. Uh, once again, please mute your microphones, everyone. I don't have access. Please mute your microphones. And uh, unfortunately for you, Tim, Gwen would like for you to repeat the name of the ficus. The psych. Oh no. How about, okay, let's see if I can do it. It's, I'll spell it. How's that? C-H-A-N-G-J-I-A-N-G-E-N-S-I-S. -E Hence, I can't spit that one out really well. And if you didn't get it now, it'll be on the video later. Yes. Good Lord. So anyways, I have a couple more things down at this end. Oh, actually, while I'm right here. This is one of my favorites. If I can get to it, I have it hidden. Um, are abutilons. Uh, this is abutilon uh, voodoo, uh, which there's a, quite a few abutilons that are hardy for us here. Uh, they'll flower through anywhere from, oh, any time that is above freezing. Actually, they'll flower even when it's in the low 20s. Really great plants. They're South American hibiscus relatives, or Malvaceae, um, Central and South American. We do have some American ones too. They're weeds. Um, the South American ones are cool. 
Um, but this is one called Voodoo. In the garden, we have uh, Megapotamicum, little imp. I love that. We have orange hot lava, which Chris is killing um, in his yard. Ours has just been flowering its head off since, I think, February. Um, just a clarification. It is perfectly fine. It just does not flower. Ours has been flowering its head off for months. Uh, Chris is not happy. He's torturing it. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, abutilons are really good in our climate for actually three seasons, I would say. Uh, if we have a really hard winter, they can get taken to the ground, but they tend to, uh, to flush very quickly and they'll start flowering again um, rather quickly in the late winter, spring if they have not been damaged too much. Megapotamicum little imp out near our necessary. I think I've had it and I remember it being in flower consecutively at least 15 months, so more than a year. And then we had a cold, a slight cold spell taking it out for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks before it recovered. Um, so really great plants in the um, Malvaceae. So down here, this is one um, Denny Werner has left in our greenhouse and I'm not going to put this one out, but this is one that we ooh and all over. But this is one of the bromeliads. I think this is a, a, a new regalia. Um, bromeliads aren't, most of them aren't hardy here. There are a handful that are, but most of the really tropically ones are not. The dryland ones are often hardy here, or some of those are, but these are great to use as container plants. You can bring them in and out. They don't require a lot of care when they're out for the summer. They will survive on our natural rain um, here for the most part, though you can water them. Uh, it won't hurt them. You can just set the whole pot out and it'll be perfect all summer long. You don't have to worry about it. I have some on my deck in my apartment and all I do is pour a little bit of water in the pitchers I, that is in the crowns. I don't even water the soil most of the time and they're content. Um, so there's a bunch of different species anywhere from the Talansias like our Spanish moss, which is the largest um, genus in the Bromeliaceae. And there's some that are great big, others are I mean, tiny. Um, those you can throw on on branches just to have that tropical look. Um, these are new regalias, pineapples, which this is just a baby one over here. Uh, once it gets much bigger than this, it becomes dangerous to move about. Uh, Doug uses this in our containers in the perennial border. And it, we set them out and don't really worry about them a whole lot until it gets cold. And then they become the, oh darn, I have to wrangle that thing in. But other than that, low maintenance for our summer gives you some spectacular colors. Uh, and again, very low maintenance out for our summers. There's literally hundreds of species of, of bromeliads you could grow in your garden for the summer. Um, and then there are a handful that we can grow year round here. So um, someone earlier asked about bananas. So I'm gonna go back over here. I like bananas and I hope no one, oh, oh where do bananas grow? I'm hoping no one says on trees. That drives me crazy. <laughs> bananas are the largest herbaceous plants. And I hear people talking about banana trees and I cringe. But um, so bananas do not grow on trees. That's my rant. But anyways, this, uh, not all bananas are hardy here. There's a handful that have been proven hardy. This is not one of them, but this is one of the most spectacular ones you can get. Um, I think Doug bought, got this at Big Bloomers. Um, or I, uh, this is Siam Ruby. Um, Tony Avent and a couple other fellows in, I think it was 2005, uh, went to Thailand and they brought this thing back. Um, they, sp they paid an exorbitant amount of money for it originally. It's now readily available from tissue culture. Um, not hardy at all here, but great foliage. It can get six, eight feet tall in a season for us. Um, this plant has been tortured in a pot for several years before I finally got it planted for the summer. We'll dig it up this fall uh, and just store it in one of our greenhouses. Bananas you can store in your basement in a crawl space or if you have a sunroom you can actually keep them somewhat active. They don't have to stay active. They're sometimes easier kept unactive. They can get mites in the winter if you try to keep them active in a dry situation. But um, this is one of the tender ones. For tropical, I mean, hardy ones, uh, there's a bunch that we can actually grow here. Uh, in our Asian Valley, we have one of the largest and hardiest species. We have Musa Baju, and that's the most common one you're going to find in this area. Um, uh, originally in uh, 2009, uh, there was a, a, a clump that we've taken out of the perennial border, but I took two pe small pieces off of it and put it in the Asian Valley about this far apart. The patches now, Oh, 
half the size of this bed uh, here and we dug it out and I think 2016 we dug out what I thought was three quarters of it and well I still had the same footprint as I did to begin with um, it was still all there it's super prolific it's one that needs space but super hardy here you can get flowers the flowers are not overly spectacular uh, they don't set fruit for us here on that species one of my favorites that is a smaller growing one is Musa volutina. We have that out near our visitor center. Our plant needs reset. It's only been there, I think, probably since 2002 or 2003 when the, it was first, probably 2003 or four, I should say, uh, when it was first planted there before I was here. Uh, it needs reset and also the, the tree right next to it has grown. So it's slowed down a little bit, but it is a reliable flowering one. It only gets six to eight feet tall, Musa volutina, the pink velvet banana. And it actually produces bananas every year for us. And I joke that it's a perfect diet food. Um, it, it, it's full of seeds. Um, and if you bite into those, you're going to be needing to have a visit to the dentist because they are that hard. I think you could pay, use them as aggregate to pave your driveway. Just add some tar there and it would match perfectly. Um, so it, they're very hard. So if you bite into that, uh, you're going to break a tooth. Uh, if you take the time to sift the pulp off, which does taste like banana, uh, you're going to waste more energy. So you're going to be an, a net loss of calories anyway. So it should be a good diet food. So since you either can't eat or or you're spending more energy eating what uh, you are. So, uh, but great plant for the landscape. Another one that's really similar to the uh, pink velvet we don't have in the garden is Musa ornata, which it comes in a couple different colors from the same pink as pink, um, the pink velvet banana, Musa volutina, to shades of uh, orange and purples. Um, but those are also typically hardy for us here. In our monocot garden behind me, way back at the other end of the trials, we have uh, a couple of different ones. We have Musa um, balbiciana, which it's one of the more tender ones, but has been hardy for us. It's one of the parent species way back in history for our edible bananas. Um, beautiful upright growth. The leaves do not rip on it like some of the other bananas. It has a bluish cast to it. I really like it. Uh, a couple other ones that are over there are Musa uh, Picasso, which is a cross between Musa sicamensis, which we actually have that species in our Asian Valley across from our uh, Musa Bajjus, as well as um, another tropical one, which I can't think of the species right now. Um, but anyways, I, we had one of uh, Picasso flower forest late last fall, and it was orange brax. It was so cool. Uh, Tony Avon apparently has also had it flower down at Plant Delights Nursery too. But it's a really cool one. Um, another one that's down there is one called uh, Musa Helen's Hybrid, which is again a cross between Musa sicamensis and a, an edible wild species from India. I don't um, know what that parentage is, but offhand, but those have all done well for us. There's several other ones that have done, um, that we don't have that you can find. Look at Plant Delights uh, or go to the Juniper Level Botanic Gardens this weekend. You'll see some different ones that they have, but I do love bananas uh, and I think they're really cool. They just get quite large. Expect to have to do a little bit of cleanup in the winter, whether if we have a mild winter and they don't dive back the whole way to the ground, you still have to take off the old foliage to make them look nice. Uh, or if we have a hard winter and they die the whole way to the ground, you can um, have this nice snotty sludge, which smells wonderful uh, when you are trying to take it away. I, <laughs> but um, I do love bananas in the garden. There is another cousin, which um, we, uh, Musella is much smaller growing. Uh, it's a, a different genus of banana, uh, Musella lassiocarpa, which you'll see it as either a lone species or uh, one of, of, of like one or two species of Musella. Uh, but uh, it gets about six to seven feet tall when it's fully in leaf. Um, but Typically, late winter, early spring, it'll start to throw up a couple flower heads and you get this enormous yellow artichoke looking flower. Really cool. The bracts are yellow, that is. The flowers are also yellow, but the bracts are the impressive thing. We've had one going in our uh, Asian Valley, I think, all, all season this year, probably since late April. It's been in blossom, but you have to look for it. It's down in the foliage. Um, but it literally lasts for months in fluorescence. So um, something really cool there. Does that answer our banana questions earlier on? 
We just had another banana question, Tim, and okay. I think you've at least partially addressed it, and maybe they didn't um, catch up on it. They are wondering about uh, a good method for controlling all the shoots that come up on their bananas. Um, I hate to say it. Removing them. Exactly. A, a big shovel or a group of interns. A piece of heavy equipment is also useful. Um, yes, we actually, whenever we ripped out two-thirds of ours in 2016, um, I used our what we call our ditch witch, and I scooped it out um, with, it's like a small skid steer. Um, that's wonderful, it saves on the back, but you can dig them out. Um, Are there any bananas that possibly grow, uh, shoot out a whole lot slower or, or less frequently? Uh, actually, I like the Balbiciana, but it's not one you're going to find readily, uh, and it's not as hardy. But it was tighter, it has started to spread, it's been in the ground probably since... I'm going to say 2014 we planted it, uh, and it, the clump is probably about 8 or 10 feet wide, um, but the, it's very upright, and it doesn't spread out like this like some of the others, like um, Musa Baju, and I really like it for that, really clean. Um, there's a little bit different look. We did have another banana question. I think it was Marilyn, surprise, surprise, is wondering about deer resistance for bananas. I think deer are afraid of those big leaves. I haven't had any issue with deer touching the bananas, the cannas, the gingers, the agaves, or the anything in the eraceae. Those are some of those safe ones. And the rabbits, I think they're a little bit too big for them to gnaw through. Uh, so I have, if we have a couple minutes, I have a couple more things off camera here that we'll wander over to if Alexander can find his way. Um, I mentioned one vine earlier which I really like, uh, it was Amanda Villa, but I really like passion flowers. And right behind me, I actually have one of my favorites. And um, I'll cut some here. And this will give me a moment to get this too, so. And let's see. And you see that? Okay, good. Okay, so I like passion flowers, and so uh, over the years we have gotten a few while I've been here, and this is one I've really liked. Uh, this is Passiflora Lady Margaret. This is actually a cross between a tropical and our native um, species Passiflora incarnata. Um, and otherwise, the, this is basically the hardiest of the red passion flowers as a result of that incarnata in them. So. And it's, I think it's crossed uh, Incarnata with, I think, Coccinia, if I remember correctly. But this one um, has been reliable for us in this bed right behind me since 2013. It does like to spread like its, uh, its, parent, its Incarnata parents. If you dig in the bed, you end up getting more um, suckering. It'll, it'll come from the roots. It'll sprout off of the roots. Um, so it, you have to want it. She's a little boisterous. This is apparently named after Queen Elizabeth's sister, Princess Margaret, which I guess she was rather boisterous in herself and kind of got into some trouble at times. So anyways, I guess that's why they called her Lady Margaret. Um, there's a, some other ones in our garden as well that I really like. I don't have it in right in this area. One called Monica Fisher, uh, which is um, from one of the main um, passion flower breeders in um, Germany, if I remember remember right and I think Monica is either his daughter or his wife or his granddaughter I don't remember which but it's a really nice purpley pink with blue filaments straight blue filaments um, Monica here has some crooked filaments um, or that is this corona this is the filaments when I say filaments but anyways I have another one over here which is not it's a shy flowering one called Elizabeth uh, which I grew this one for years, uh, that one for years in a pot back home in Pennsylvania. And it, I'd get flowers about the, uh, our first freeze, but I had it up right next to our house. So it was, it was in late October, but she would get great big four to six inch flowers, smell of cloves. She's a cross between one of the tropical fruiting species and again, our native uh, Passiflora incarnata. Uh, and so that has done reasonably well over here. She never suckers, but she's shy flowering. Some years I don't get any flowers, but I am so happy when she does flower and I get those four to six inch uh, blossoms. Um, it's kind of a, a mottled purple or lavendery shade and spicy fragrance. Love it. I don't think this one's fragrant. No, <laughs> excuse me. Nothing much on this passiflora. 
Anyways, that's enough on my passion flowers. Also in this bed are, I mean, and you're probably growing these again, salvias. There's so many salvias. The New World salvias, a lot of them are actually of tropical origin. Uh, this is, um, I can't even remember this one offhand, but this is a salvia garnetica hybrid. Um, I think this is something like, something blue jeans. But anyways, these have been excellent for us. Yesterday I was walking by here several times and actually while we were here, I was seeing hummingbirds coming and going from this. Uh, there's countless other uh, subtropical uh, and tropical salvias we can grow here. Uh, so one that was actually over uh, in the bed where we were at earlier is just starting to flower, a salvia oxyphora. It has these really fuzzy pink flowers I find so cool. It roots like a weed. It's been uh, hardy for us since about 2010 or 12, I think, in the, the garden. Um, and it'll flower repeatedly. Um, just a really cool one to go. Uh, there's so many of the salvias that you could use in your landscape, whether the southwestern species from, um, uh, or that is from southwestern United States into northern Mexico, you get the salvia gregii, which I would consider them subtropicals. Um, those flower anywhere for us from March to, to November. Uh, so really free flowering. Um, so just a couple cool things. And it's a little after four. Do we have much time left, Chris? There's, there's, oh. Are still people on there, or did you just? Still people hanging out. Okay, as I'm for seeing a plant I forgot back here, which I think my interns are looking at. So we're gonna go over to the other bed again. So, uh, and we'll get a couple things probably. And my interns might get in their view again. So, um, this is one I really love. These. Um, this is a tibachina. And I have to even look at the cultivar on this one and the species. Um, Ervilliana is the, the species, and this is, um, oh darn, half of his name is off here, I think, but Edwards <coughs> is the, the cultivar on this one. But this is just starting to flower. Um, late season, these are really good. These are related to our native Rexias. If you go out into the, the coastal plain, you will see Rexias grow in, in the bogs. Uh, this is tropical South American. Um, these can grow here as a dieback perennial. They, I don't know how big they'll get that uh, that way. I haven't grown them yet outside, though I know Mark has one in his garden. Um, and I have one uh, that I gave to some of my cousins out on the coast. I don't know if Pat is on there, but she's been giving me updates on how it's been doing in the, this spring, so in early summer. <coughs> Excuse me, but they are waiting for these spectacular purple blossoms, sometimes called, I think, princess trees. Uh, there's several other species that you sometimes see available to plant as summer annuals, but um, in Florida, these will survive. <coughs> Excuse me, my water is over there, but I'm not gonna get it at this moment. We're almost done. Um, one that might not be overly apparent from uh, right now is over here, and it's, it's, it's withered for the day. Uh, but this is another purple flower, and this was, if anybody knows the uh, black-eyed Susan vines, uh, Thunbergia alata. This is its cousin, and I have, to, I have the name written down for this because I can't spit out its species without having to look at it. Um, Bata, Batacombii is the species on this one. Um, a lot of the Thunbergias are vines, vigorous vines. This one is more shrubby for us, and this one actually will survive out here in, um, most years. I mean, three out of five years, uh, we will get uh, these to survive. Spectacular deep purple flowers uh, throughout the summer. Um, and into the fall. Uh, it'll get probably three to four feet tall uh, by the end of summer for us here. So, um, and it's easy enough to root. So if you want to, uh, are afraid that you're going to lose it, uh, you just stick a few cuttings in the fall and you can keep it through the winter that way. Uh, but that's in the acanthus family. There's so many other things in the acanthus family. Um, uh, I have, they're not flowering now, they just finished already, but we have this in the garden. And another part is a justicia, uh, another kissing cousin of that would be the um, um, strobilanthes, also related to that, um, grown for their foliage. They are, uh, strobilanthes dariana is a tender perennial for us here, uh, but who cares? You can plant this one and get a decent sized plant very quickly through the summer. And it, where else do you get this uh, metallic purple foliage? Um, just a few of my favorites here in the tropicals. There's so much more out there. Explore your uh, local nurseries and see what they might have. You never know. Uh, an experiment. Um, actually, some of the philodendrons are hardy. I mean, I wouldn't have ever thought that 
of when I moved down here 15 years ago from Western Pennsylvania. So actually 16 years ago. But uh, there's so many more things we can grow here. Um, they may be hardy, they may not. Just give it a try. And like I said, if you have that plant that you don't know what to do with, it's outgrown your house, stick it out in the garden. Just give it some shade for a few days before you do that. Just to acclimatize it. But have some fun. Any questions? Well, I do want to add, Tim, that uh, Pat is online and uh -huh. she reports that Tibbetine is doing great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, while we wait for some questions to come up, uh, there was a fun comment by Paul. I think he did that uh, publicly. He said the name of the Cycad looked like someone dropped the Scrabble box. Exactly. It's, it's a Chinese name and I am not good at spitting them out and I probably get I do them no justice on pronunciations. I got a small gig a lot of that one. Um, so if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and answer them. I, or ask them, excuse me. <laughs> you can answer them. Yeah, you can answer time. them for yourself. Uh, I do hope that we got to most of them. Um, I am sure I missed one, uh, one or two of them, but I would like to note that Wi-Fi did not drop today. Yay, that's the first in a long time. We did get a new device, so hopefully I'll be good to go from here on out. So thanks for joining us today. It does not look like we're getting any questions, Tim. Okay. Just a bunch of kudos. So Hopefully so I inspired time. somebody to plant some uh, some things. So. Yep, I think you did. And uh, thanks again for the tour. And thank you, Alexander, for a great job in videoing. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope we'll see you next week for our uh, Gardening 101 program, where we'll be out near the Cascade talking about uh, container water gardens. We will see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye.